So I, oops, I hope you are all awake after lunch. So I will try to make this session a little bit interactive. So I will ask you questions and you hopefully will answer some of these questions. And I know that I'm on the funding track and the title in here is talking beyond funding. So probably will be pretty much interesting or at least challenging some of the uh, different talks that happened in this track before. Who in here uses open source in their tech stack? <laughs> That's easy. Everyone should raise their hands. It's 99%. We learned that thing from three different talks at least that I was on. So everyone in here should have raised their hands because we're not 100. So statistically, everyone. Who is, who knows what their SBOM looks like? Or who knows what an SBOM is? And do you know how it looks like? Can we agree? that we have a problem in one way or another. So dependencies in the open source projects are a nightmare if you need to manage them. If you don't, they are OK, because you just use an open source project and it works. But basically, you probably ask the question, how many dependencies do we have? That's the first question. And usually, it's too many. And how many dependencies those ones have? Way too many. And how many levels do we go into transient dependencies? Do we go one level, two levels, three levels, 25 levels, cycles? That's a nice waste of time there when you don't realize that you're in a cycle. So how many levels did we go? All these are questions that we need to ask when looking at our open source projects and our dependencies. So the usual answer to this problem is let's fund those. And the problem that comes when creating a fund, I know that, for example, Pear has a Spotify fund. Probably that was one of the first questions that you might have had there. It's like, and how much money did we put there? That much? That's too much? That's too few? What's the right amount of money? And which projects do we fund? And do we have a voting process? Do we have a selection in some case? Do we make it public? Do we make it internal for the companies? And how can we make sure that it reach where it really needs to reach? So we might think that we want to fund some foundations or some groups or, or entities. How do we know that the projects in need are the ones getting those ones? Sometimes it's complicated. And are we really making sure that by funding those projects, they are effectively maintained? So I am here on the funding track of FOSS Backstage to tell you that what if there was another way to help those projects that it's not relying on funds? And that's what I will try to explain today. And what I propose to help on that space is extraspective OSPOS. It's a mouthful, uh, but nobody uses this thing. So hopefully, if you search for that one, you will only get these links because nobody else uses this word. Uh, so basically, extrospective goes playing words with introspection, as in I'm looking towards the inside, so extrospective looks towards the outside. And what that means is that you have an open source program office whose focus is to contribute to your dependency graph. So you're not anymore contributing and creating an open source project for everyone to use. You work on the dependency graph. We have one of those ones, and then I can try to explain how we make it work. So what we have is a group of engineers that report to the open source program office. So they are separated from the rest of engineering, and they are a complete different unit. That means that they can have independent timelines. If a project has a need, it, they can have those needs. They will have some deadlines. The open source work will not be affected by those ones. People working on the open source space, they have their own timelines and they own those ones. And they're not affected by, we need to release this thing. What do we need to cut right now? We will cut the open source work, always. So let's keep them separated so you cannot cut that. The work that these teams do is 100% open source. So these teams are not working on anything that goes inside of the private repositories areas. They just go and work on the open source projects. But then you say, yeah, cool. You tell me, let's create a team. That sounds great. That works only on open source projects. But which ones? And that's a really big question. So there are two main 
and probably there are way more, but basically I want to present two different options on how you can select projects that you have to focus on. The first one is to pick them semantically speaking, as in what makes sense. And I will go deeper into what that means. And the second one is hierarchically. So you just get your first level, second level, third level, fourth level, fifth, 25th level. So try to cover as much as you can. So when we try to pick projects semantically, it means that we go onto the projects that we have right now, even the projects that are not our production system. It might be our CI system. It might be our monitoring system. It might be anything surrounding that supports us, that supports our business. We go there and we start looking at all of the dependencies in there. And we look the ones that would hurt us the most if they would go away. And those ones are the ones that we need to pick. We pick the ones that they make more sense for us to exist. If they would disappear, we will have problems. So we short the list by impact on your business. And those are your target projects. And then try to prioritize between those and start stuffing those projects. An example, let's say that we have this project here. It's super simplified and actually no project looks like that because that's even too easy. I mean, that would be too simple. Uh, but from this project here, in this particular case, we will say that project one, project six, and project 11 are projects that we really depend on and there is no replacement, there is no other way that we could live without those ones. Those are the ones that we should be start stuffing. Then we can have second level of impact, third level of impact, fourth level of impact, and so on. And then we staff people on that criteria. That works. Obviously needs to have a clear understanding of what makes your business reliant and basically what depends your business on. If you cannot do that, you can go picking the project hierarchically. So you go on the first level and you start from the top till the bottom and then you run out of people on the fourth or fifth or sixth dependency. But anyway, you can try to go on hierarchical level and try to cover as much as you can on those ones. So in this particular one, we would cover project one, project two and project three. If you have enough people, if we have more, then we could go project four and maybe project five and so on and so on. So that's the other way of picking projects. And you need to basically look and try to pick the one that works best for you. Some business models are more prone to help picking them semantically and some other ones hierarchically. And probably that's a $1 million question. Like, why <laughs> does it make sense to do these things? So why should we do that? So in the end is to make open source projects more sustainable. So we want the open source projects that we care about, that we love, that we depend on, we want them to exist not just now, not just next month, next year, and next 10 years. We want them to exist, quote, quote, forever, as much as forever exists in tech world. So yeah, uh, probably it's only two months, right? So, <laughs> uh, so what we want to do is reduce the bus factor. Uh, or that was really funny because uh, I think Flora was mentioning once the lottery factor, uh, but actually that doesn't really work in open source because if I would get a lottery, I would win that. I would probably still work on open source projects, which probably tells wrong things about me or good things, I don't know. But uh, normal people, if they get a lottery, they will stop working probably. Uh, the bus factor is the more radical one that says if you got killed by a bus, then yeah. So that was trying to do the more nicey way, but anyway. So we want to reduce the bus factor. We want to have more people working on those projects. So if something happens, we don't rely on just one single person, we rely on a group of people. We want to share the maintenance burden. So we want to make sure that not that one person in Nebraska does everything. We have at least one person in Nebraska and somebody else working at some other companies that can help and support those things. So they are not just one single person. We try to help and support that. Again, we hear a lot of complaints from people saying, yeah, I'm working full-time open source and nobody pays my salary. There is no way I'm making a living out of it. That's another way of letting some people have a living of it. So we employ open source maintainers to work on open source space. So that means that your expertise, everything you were doing just because, now suddenly it's also your way of living. We were listening this morning that you have these um, sabbatical and like the München was doing the sabbatical year on open source. Why 
do the sabbatical when we can do our work. So the more companies they do these things, the more job market will be for open source maintainers to work full time on the projects. And again, we want to keep the projects open. We don't want that, we don't want to give excuses to companies to say, look, um, closing the project because effectively it was the only one contributing to it anyway. So we want to not make that statement true anymore. We want to have different companies contributing to projects. So we create a community around you and not just by using, but also contributing code and helping and supporting the projects. That's good. And you might want to say, yeah, good, but uh, and how do we know if you're doing the right thing and if we're, doing, if we're going the right steps in the right direction? AKA, how do we measure success? So at project level, if we look at the project, after we have one of these OSPOs, what we want is that the project has lower time to review. So whenever somebody pushes changes into the project, you need to wait less time because more people are actively contributing to the project, more people are actively reviewing projects, and more people are actively maintaining that project. So that should, hopefully, uh, reduce the time to review. It, hopefully, should reduce the number of issues because, again, if there are open issues, there will be somebody who will tackle them and they will try to work on those ones and help improving them. So if you look, monitor the health of the project over time, after you put these new people into the project, those numbers should go down, hopefully. And the other one should go up, because again, you're bringing people in, and maybe not just your people, the ones that the company brings in are newcomers there, but maybe other companies are the same things. Or maybe now, now that we have a shorter um, time to review and less issues, more contributors come to the project, because, oh, now suddenly the project is healthier. So now we have more contributors. And that's how we can see if the project, what we do, has an impact at project level. But obviously, we need to also know the people. Are they doing right? So how can a person working in this kind of OSPO say, hi, how am I doing? Am I doing right? So what we want them to do is basically three main things. The first one, it's obvious, is contribute. We want them to contribute bug fixes, features, anything that the community needs. Second one, we want them to review pull requests and triage issues and help on designing systems there. What happens right now is that many maintainers that are already in projects around the world, they do this thing on their free time, not at work time. Why don't we change that? And we can do that. So as a company, we can decide how we measure success and we can decide what makes sense for people to spend their time on. That makes sense. And lastly, but not least, is increase awareness of the projects. That means that people should be on those projects advocating for them, welcoming newcomers, helping writing documentation. I don't know, like going to a conference and talk about the project. Those things are also work. You should not just work the PRs, and that's only I will measure you and how many PRs you did. That's short-sighted, and by measuring that, we create toxic communities. That's an attempt to measure three things that if people optimize for those, we will get better communities in the end. So let's measure that. And I didn't introduce myself, so my name is Joseph Trat. I work at Ivan, and I now I will explain how we did the same thing. So now it's almost two years that we have a nose like that at Ivan, and I want to explain a couple of things and what we do and how we do things. So we focus on six projects that we picked semantically. Ivan offers managed services on certain quote, quote, databases, but even not databases because Kafka is not a database and probably Flink is also not a database. But anyway, so it's open source data platforms as a service, but that's too long. So we contribute to Kafka, for example, we contribute to Flink, we contribute to Cassandra, we contribute to Postgres, we contribute to OpenSearch, we contribute to ClickHouse. And basically those ones, we pick them semantically. Why? Because Ivan offers all those services as a service. So for us, it's trivial. So for, for us, to pick semantically is like a, a no-brainer. 
with what do we offer as a managed service, those things, let's contribute to those ones back. I agree, not everyone might have it that easily, or not everyone is so easy to pick them semantically, but it's a way. If you are a SaaS company, you're welcome to contribute to those things. Um, all these brands belong to their respective owners, so um, we don't own OpenSearch. Uh, that's trademark law, sorry. Uh, licensing and trademark law. That's we have around 15 people working on upstream projects and around five more working on projects that are owned by Ivan. So we have, for a around 500 people company, we have 15 people working on those projects. That might give you some kind of uh, level of percentage of people working on that. You don't need to pick the same proportion. Feel free to go the way you want, but basically we, needed, we wanted to have at least one person per project, hopefully two people per project, and if it's really needed, if the project is really great, we want to have three people per project. And we started the whole OSPO team with zero maintainers, and now we grew the team to have five maintainers of those dependencies over there, but many of the people who work on the OSPO already are maintainers of several projects before they joined. For example, Claude over there. Uh, so now, the last part of the talk, which is, hopefully, I managed to convince you somehow that that's a nice way to go, and now you might need to go back and convince your bosses to do that way. So I will try to convince you on that one. So what, what we do, why we exist, is to sustain the business. Our work basically goes into the foundations of what the company has as a business model. The work we do works on the viability of the company itself. So in a sense, as Claude was mentioning today on his talk in the morning, that the coffee house created in the end the first shipping insurance, that could be a way of saying that as an insurance. We are an insurance to the business model, not so much to the projects themselves, but basically the companies could use an OSPO like that if something happened to those projects, we have people who will help us push that forward and who will help us mitigate the impact of losing those projects. And that's, that speaks to people that have, for example, VC investing on your company. That speaks to them, that they understand that. They are not just doing this thing for the sake of it's the right thing to do, which is what I believe in. It's the right thing to do. But People with the money probably don't care that much about that. They want to put some money in and want money out. That's the way of guaranteeing that they will get money out eventually. Fast reaction. So, uh, luck for Jay, anyone? So, we don't want to prevent luck for Jay. So, it's, it's not that we will prevent all single vulnerabilities in the world. They will happen. But what we want to do, what we want to achieve, is to react to them faster. So, we don't rely on... Log4j was, if I'm not mistakenly, there was only one active developer who was doing everything, all the fixes, after his work shift. That's what we want to change. So we want to employ people to work on this project so if anything happens, we have enough people ready to jump and help. It's not, we will probably solve a couple of the vulnerabilities. We will probably catch some of the things there. But that's not the main point. The main point is to have them solve quicker. We want to ensure sustainability. So the team, basically, we want to make sure that the project goes into the right places. So it goes, it grows and evolves as long as with the community, together with the community. If the project is left alone and nobody contributes to it, it will start just listening to itself, being in a small echo chamber, and just doing what the project thinks people might do. By approaching them, reaching them, trying to push the project from within, we are able to even help driving the project to the right places they need to be driven. And be a sparring partner for the actual maintainers of the project, that they might want to have somebody else from the outside giving an external opinion. And my call to action to all of you is that if you find any of these things resonating with you, 
please go back to your companies, go back, talk to your bosses, and try to create these kind of OSPOs because, yes, funding is very much needed, but we also need lots of developers working on open source projects that are the bare bone of the internet. Thank you very much. That's the slides that will bring you to the slide deck that we had here, and I'm here around for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josep. So we have a question there. Hello, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I have one question. You, you said uh, funding or extra, how, how was the word? Extra, extrospective. Extrospective. But how about joining those? You can terms, totally join. No, no, in, in terms of, I've, I, I'm in the position of being maintainer and having teams uh, starting to contribute from, like, in, in the very, very way you described. Mm -hmm. And I found the biggest problem of those external teams is how to do it. Yes. And they, they, they just don't know because they, uh, they are used to their own ways of working in the big corporate, whatever. And I found the best way of working, of the, making this works is that those uh, extra, Difficult word. Uh, <laughs> I know. I know. The, this, uh, these offices are yes, retrospective. Offices are actually paying a small amount of money to the maintainers to help them to learn how to do that. Yeah. To become like their guides in the way how to do that. And that would be. What do you think about that? Absolutely. So it, it depends. It's it's not either off. I'm not saying do not do funds anymore. Forget about those ones. I'm saying there is another way. Not a complete, like, opposite way. There is another way to do that. You can use the extrospective output to help calculate where to put your money. There is another way as well. Like, what if instead of giving a funding, they would hire one of the people who are maintainers, who are working, like, one of these people could work full-time on that project. That's the other way of saying it. It's not, we're not funding the project at that level. We are funding the people that make the project. Also, we could do funding at level of infrastructure, for example, and things like that. But yeah, it's, you can combine both, and you can use that group of people to know where are the problems. Just yeah. Mentor you yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Pau from, from Barcelona. Um, we, Hola. We, <laughs> Hola. Um, with, with Ivan, we, we found a, a, a company, an open source company, that um, it's practically uh, the total speed that you, that you said. It's a, a reflection also. So uh, we are working in the maintenance of an open source project that it's called the CD. It's a digital framework for citizen participation. So, for example, I, I have two, two questions more, more deeper. The one is... Um, the top level, no, it's, uh, it's uh, the reviewers of, the, of this project, of the, of the maintainers. Um, uh, doing reviews, it's not the, 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 the most creative job, let's no. say that. Um, so how, how, how can we make happy the, the, the reviewers? We have to combine with developing, because if they are developing, they are not reviewing. Um, we have to pay more money uh, to, to these people. And, and also, I don't know how you address that in your, in your company. And in the other way, um, for example, we work with one technology that is called Ruby, um, that it's not uh, the, the best uh, knowing in all, all the people. So we are in this point that we want to make jun uh, a junior to a senior on how to scale that. But we find very difficult. So I don't know if you have like any, any methodology in your, yep. in your company. Thank you. It's a, it's a good question. The, basically what we do is like we decided to split it in these three different things that we measure on performance. So the usual stuff would be contributions, number of PRs, number of commits, whatever you want. That's only one small part of the picture. By hiring the people on the right mentality, these people should also, in some weird way, enjoy having PR reviews. It's not that it's the best thing ever, and I agree. It's part of the whole mix. So you need to combine work, what motivates you, what gives you kind of like the kick, and I'm happy I landed these two commits, with the work that needs to be done, which is pull request reviews. You need to do those ones, because you love the kick when somebody clicks merge. You love that. You love that feeling. Make that happen for somebody else. Give that thing back. So it's, it's combining those things, but you need to hire the people who leave those values. I, I cannot bring, I cannot make that happen to a person that doesn't want to do it. 
we can put the measures, we can put like, that's what we want, that's what you need to do to be successful, but that's what, as much as we can do. The person needs to want to do that and needs to leave those values. So I would probably try to look for that on the hiring process as well and try to see how you can apply this thing at work. And for the growing people, yeah, usually juniors will most focus on the pushing changes, while more senior people will start doing maybe more substantial reviews. And that's what you need to mentor one to the other and then do combined reviews, for example, and things like that. But happy to chat afterwards as well, if you want. We're going to have one last question. All right, so yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, so maybe you can share why you um, went with a centralized model of maintainers in, in the OSPO instead of embedding them into the different product teams, because it seems you have a team that is responsible for hosting Kafka, and it might, why didn't it make sense to put like a dedicated Kafka maintainer in that team so they had a better idea of your business requirements and so on? Because it will happen, and it, it happens even if we are in a separated team, that when something is really urgent on that product team, the one that makes the product, right? We will need an all hands. And everyone, drop what you're doing, just do that. And that will happen if there is a maintainer in that team, they will tell, stop what you're doing, do that. You can do that once, you can do that twice. The third time is already, yeah, yeah, that will happen every single second day. And we have people here from the OpenSearch project. One of the things that you see, that you want to see from contributors that they come regularly and that you can um, take them as a fixed thing in your system, in an ecosystem, that they are reliable. So the thing that we, so it was, it's probably a nuclear approach as well, but the most, the, the best way that we found out to give the reliability is to keep them in a separated packet so they can fully concentrate on those projects. That doesn't mean we don't look at what breaks in production. We are, doesn't mean that we cannot talk to the people that they are making the product, but we have two separated teams and they end there. We help, we contribute, we support each other, but they have different product lines, work, uh, um, work streams and work roadmaps. So it's a complete different thing. Welcome. Great. Um, thanks, um, Josep. So I guess you'll be around if people have more questions, they, yeah. they can approach you later. Today and tomorrow. Yeah, great. So let's thank Josep again.